Good morning students. Welcome to today's lecture. This is the fourth week of the lockdown and I hope by now all of us are used to the concept of online learning. The topic for today's lecture is Disorder of Development of Teeth and Craniofacial Anomalies. This is the part one of the topic. So the learning outcomes for today's topic will include on how to identify and describe disturbances in number, size and form of teeth. Describe in detail hypohydrotic ectodermal dysplasia. I hope all of us remember the image shown in here. This shows the various stages of odontogenesis wherein the dental lamina undergoes a series of changes to give rise to the enamel organ which ultimately leads to the normal development of tooth. <coughs> However, under certain circumstances, this process of odontogenesis undergoes disturbances. These include a severe infection, exposure to toxic levels of chemicals or medications, localized trauma to the area of development leading to a variety of developmental anomalies. So the developmental anomalies affecting the tooth may be in relation to the number, the size of the tooth, the form or morphology of the tooth and the structure of the tooth. In today's topic we are going to discuss the developmental anomalies affecting the number, size and morphology of the tooth. The image here shows the advanced bell stage of odontogenesis. As you can see the, the form of the tooth is established and the cells of the inner enamel epithelium and the odontoblast starts secreting the dentin first and then the enamel which leads to the formation of the crown. Disturbances occurring during these stages of morphodifferentiation may result in developmental anomalies affecting the number, size and form of tooth. Here you can see the dentition in each arch. The permanent dentition shows a total of 32 teeth whereas the deciduous dentition shows a total of 20 teeth. Intraoral examination should always include counting the number of teeth present. A decrease in number or an increase in number of teeth within the oral cavity may indicate the presence of a developmental anomaly associated with the number. These disturbances in relation to the number of teeth may be an increase in number also referred to as supernumerary teeth, a decrease in number of teeth present within the arch this is referred to as hypodontia or oligodontia or in rare instances the total absence of teeth. This phenomenon is referred to as anodontia. Hypodontia means the congenital absence of one or several teeth whereas anodontia means the complete absence of one or both the dentition. In anodontia, either the primary, the entire primary dentition is absent or the permanent dentition is absent. The permanent dentition is more commonly affected than the primary dentition. Hypodontia affects a population, a population percentage of 2 to 10 percent. Females are more commonly affected. It is unusual for deciduous tooth to be absent. The most common missing tooth are said to be the third molars, maxillary lateral incisors and mandibular second premolars. Other than the third molars, the maxillary lateral incisor is thought to be the common tooth which is found to be congenitally missing. Increase in number of teeth 
or hypodontia is also referred to as commonly as supernumerary teeth. As you can see in the pic picture here, the lateral, the maxillary lateral incisor on both the quadrants are missing. So this is an example of hypodontia. To determine if there is a developmental anomaly in relation to the number of tooth that is hypodontia or hyperdontia, we need to count the number of teeth. In case of hypodontia, we, take, we need to take a proper history in relation to the tooth loss. If we find a, the number of teeth to be less, first we need to take a thorough case history from the patient and determine the various reasons for the tooth loss. We should keep in mind that we should rule out extraction of teeth, loss of teeth due to any periodontal cause or loss of teeth due to trauma. Another common reason for a tooth not to be seen within the oral cavity is its failure to erupt. So we need to always rule out impaction. Radiographic image, imaging techniques are an important way to find out whether a tooth is impacted or not. As you can see in this picture, the maxillary lateral incisor is congenitally missing. Its absence has been ruled out by taking a thorough history and the radiograph shows that there is no impaction in relation to the lateral incisor that is 2-2. Hyperdentia should also be assessed in the same way. First we need to count the number of tooth. We need to make sure that there is more than the normal set of teeth that is 32 in case of, super, uh, in case of permanent teeth. A proper case history should be taken. We should ask the patient if he or she has noticed any extra tooth. Sometimes the extra tooth may be in relation to an over retained deciduous tooth. So we have to rule out that this is not a deciduous tooth. Finally, a radiographic imaging technique will help us to identify whether it is a supernumerary tooth or not. In some cases, in relation to hypodontia, the deciduous tooth may be overretained. Failure of formation of a permanent tooth may result in the overretained deciduous dentition. The image, the radiographic image here shows three overretained deciduous tooth. However, there is absence of any impacted or underlying permanent tooth. So it should be kept in mind that deciduous tooth may be over-retained in cases of hypodontia and needs to be ruled out during the counting process. So is it really important to know the number of teeth? Hypodontia or hyperdontia are generally asymptomatic. Supernumerary tooth can cause, cause crowding and aesthetic disturbances to the patient. Functional disturbances can also be caused due to derangement in the occlusion. Rarely, these, tooth, these teeth may give rise to development of cysts. However, the most important aspect of these developmental defects in relation to the number are indicative of an undiagnosed syndrome. The disturbances in number of teeth are usually associated with various syndromes. Hypodontia, for example, is commonly associated with cleft lip or cleft palate, Krausen syndrome, Down syndrome, hypohydrotic ectodermal dysplasia, Ellis Van Crivel syndrome, also known as chondroectodermal dysplasia, and oral facial digital syndrome. The students are advised to make a note of all the syndromes and the associated features of the same. Among these syndromes, the hypohydrotic ectodermal dysplasia is the most significant syndrome associated with hypodontia. We will be discussing this syndrome in detail in the further slides. Hypodontia, on the other hand, 
is also related with cleft lip and cleft palate, cleidocranial dysplasia, Garda syndrome, oral facial digital syndrome. Among this, the cleidocranial dysplasia is an important syndrome associated with increased number of teeth. The related features of these syndromes should be memorized by the students. Hypohydrotic ectodermal dysplasia, also known as ectodermal dysplasia syndromes, presents as two common syndromes, the hypohydrotic ectodermal dysplasia and the hydrotic ectodermal dysplasia. These syndromes are a result of chromosomal defect leading to aberrant development in ectodermal structures. It should be remembered that all the ectodermally derived structures are malformed or deficient in a patient. It is an, the hypohydrotic form of ectodermal dysplasia is X-linked and is related to a mutation in the ED1 gene. Whereas the hydrotic type of ectodermal dysplasia is related to a defect in the GJB6 gene which is present in the long arm of chromosome 13. The hypohydrotic ectodermal dysplasia presents with typical features. This syndrome is commonly seen in the Caucasian population and present with severe dental, hair and nail abnormalities which are readily evident in the infancy and childhood. As you can see in the image here, this syndrome is associated with sparse scalp hair. The hair is short, fine and dry. Also you can notice some dental anomaly in patients with hypohydrotic ectodermal dysplasia. We will discuss about this in the further slides. Other components to be affected in this syndrome include the sweat glands which are ectodermally derived structures. The sweat glands are absent or sparse. Mucous glands are absent in the salivary glands, lacrimal glands and upper respiratory tract. This results in severe dryness of these systems. The teeth show abnormal morphogenesis or complete absence of development. Nails are brittle, thin or deformed. Other anomalies to be associated with hypohydroctic ectodermal dysplasia include cleft lip and cleft palate, deficient hearing, vision, missing fingers or toes and lack of breast development. The oral manifestation of ectodermal dysplasia includes predominantly hypodontia or complete anodontia. The teeth are characteristically truncated or cone shaped. The occluso, the inciso cervical or occluso cervical height is reduced which results in a decreased vertical dimension. The patient presents with protuberant lips, high palatal arch or cleft palate. Since the salivary glands are affected, this will result in xerostomia, that is dryness of the mouth. So this was the description for hypohydrotic ectodermal dysplasia. This is an important topic and I, I request the students to remember each component well. Moving on to the next topic that is supernumerary tooth. A supernumerary tooth is one that is additional to the normal series and can be found in almost any region of the dental arch. Supernumerary teeth are common in the maxillary anterior and molar region followed by the mandibular premolar region. Such anomalies are common in females affecting 1 to 3 percent of the population. Supernumerary tooth are more commonly seen in the permanent dentition as opposed to the deciduous dentition and are usually associated with cleft palate, cleidocranial dysplasia or Gardner syndrome. Supernumerary 
teeth can be classified on the basis of various characteristics. These can be classified on the basis of location as mesodense, paramolar, distomolar and parapremolar, on the basis of morphology as conical, tuberculate, supplemental and odontomes, on the basis of orientation as vertical or normal, inverted and horizontal, on the basis of position as buccal, palatal and transverse. The first two phases of classification, basis of classification that is on the basis of location and morphology are important and needs further revision. Some examples of supernumeral tooth based on location. You can see four images here. The first one is the presence of a cone shaped tooth in between the two maxillary incisors. Such form of supernumeral tooth are known as mesiodense. Here you can see a supernumeral tooth on the buccal aspect of the mandibular second molar. These are referred to as paramolar because they are present either on the buccal or lingual aspect of a molar. The third image shows presence of supernumeral tooth bilaterally in relation to the premolars, mandibular premolars on the lingual aspect of mandibular premolars. Such anomalies are referred to as parapremolars. And the last image here shows a supernumeral tooth on the distal aspect of the mandibular third molar. Such anomalies are referred to as distomolars. So based on the location, supernumeral tooths can be the most common forms of supernumeral tooth are shown here. <coughs> Other examples of supernumeral tooth on the basis of morphology can be conical. As you can see in this image, the supernumeral tooth has a tapering, shows a tapering towards the incisal or occlusal surface. It should be remembered that mostly the mesodense presents a conical morphology. The supernumeral tooth may present well-defined cuspal morphology and are referred to as the tuberculate forms. Such supernumeral tooth are generally seen in the posterior segment of the quadrant. Then there are some supernumeral tooth which resembles the normal dentition, normal series of dentition and are referred to as supplemental. As you can see in this image, there are two lateral incisors. This is not a retained deciduous tooth and, and resembles a permanent dentition. Such teeth are referred to as supplemental. The supplemental supernumeral tooth are generally found at the end of the series. For example, a lateral incisor found next to the lateral incisor or an extramolar found distal to the molar. A distomolar can also be considered as a, a supplementary supernumeral teeth. Finally, the supernumeral tooth may be some ill-defined conglomerate of calcified structures. Such anomalies are referred to as odontomes. Moving on to the next topic. Sometimes the tooth may show abnormality in size. They may be either a miniature form of the natural tooth. Such anomalies are referred to as microdontia or they may develop abnormally large, referred to as macrodontia. So based on the size, a developmental anomaly can be either a small or an enlarged tooth. Microdontia includes one or more tooth that are smaller than normal for that tooth type. The most common form of microdontia affects only one or two teeth. It is much rarer in the primary than in the permanent dentition. This anomaly most often affects the maxillary third molars and lateral incisors. It is noteworthy that the affected teeth are usually the ones that are most often missing. You should also be remembered that supernumerary teeth are frequently small in size. 
patients with ectodermal dysplasia also present with microdontia. The image here shows a, a lateral incisor which has not developed to its normal size. This is a common occurrence and such teeth are referred to as peg laterals or peg shaped laterals. When the tooth are developed large, they are referred to as macrodontia. Macrodontia can be further categorized as true, generalized, relatively generalized or isolated. The image here shows an isolated case of macrodontia wherein the central incisor of the second quadrant that is 2-1 is abnormally large when compared to the normal incisor, central incisor that is 1-1. True generalized macrodontia is a condition in which all the teeth are larger than normal. Such condition is usually associated with a hormonal disturbance such as pituitary gigantism. But this occurrence is rare. Relative generalized macrodontia is a condition which is more common is more pronounced in the presence of normal or slightly larger than normal teeth in smaller jaws. So the teeth may not be actually as large but the smaller size or deficient size of the jaws gives it an appearance of a macrodontia. Isolated macrodontia is a single large tooth. This is relatively uncommon The next set of developmental anomalies are basically related to the form of the tooth. A variety of uh, developmental anomalies have been described and termed as gemination, fusion, concrescence, dilaceration, talens cusp, dense indente, dense in evaginatus, and torodontism. So, does it really affect if the morphology of the tooth is affected? Yes, we'll discuss this one by one. Gemination, derived from the zodiac sign Gemini, which means twins. Gemination is defined as an attempt at division of a single tooth germ by invagination, resulting in a single tooth with two completely separated crowns or a large incompletely separated crown having single root and root canal. The image here shows a large tooth but which seems to have a, a imagination here. So it appears that these are two teeth. Gemination is commonly described as a double teeth. Other terms given are double formations, joint teeth, fused teeth. Sometimes the word dental twinning is used. This occurrence is more commonly seen in the maxillary anterior region. Clinically, gen gemini uh, gemination causes aesthetic problems related to tooth alignment, spacing and arch asymmetry. The presence of deep grooves on the surface makes it susceptible to caries and periodontal problems by facilitating bacterial plaque accumulation. The eruption of adjacent tooth may also be impeded. When the process of gemination is completely occurred, wherein the split of the tooth germ occurs completely, it results in two completely formed tooth that means an extra tooth is formed such a process is referred to as twinning both these tooth may appear normal in morphology but the size may somewhat be decreased gemination on the other hand is the incomplete division of the tooth germ such that the tooth will have a single root but appear to have two well formed crowns which are fused A similar looking anomaly is also referred to as fusion. As you can see here, the anomaly looks somewhat similar to what we have seen before. However, this may not be exactly the same 
pathology. Gemination includes the splitting of the tooth germ into two, whereas fusion includes joining of two tooth germs during development. Hence, fusion is the union between dentin and enamel of two or more separate developing tooth. There may be complete union to form one abnormally large tooth, union of crowns or union of root only. Hence, fusion can be complete, referred to as total or true fusion, or incomplete, referred to as partial or late fusion. Total or partial fusion depends on the stage of development. An important point to be noted here is in case of fusion, the tooth count reveals a missing tooth, where the anomalous tooth is counted as one. In case of gemination, we will find an extra number of tooth because a single tooth germ has divided or attempted to divide into two teeth. So this is the most important differentiating factor and should be kept in mind during clinical evaluation. Fusion may cause aesthetic problems and occlusal disturbances due to crowding and irregular morphology respectively. The presence of deep grooves may predispose to caries or periodontal diseases and cause early pulp exposure. The greater root mass and increased surface area would result in delayed resorption and subsequently cause delayed or ectopic eruption of the permanent successors. So we have to remember here that fusion involves joining of two separate tooth germs whereas gemination is a splitting of a single tooth germ into two. Both these conditions can be referred to as double teeth when clinically examined and needs to be further evaluated for identifying the actual pathology. A third type of anomaly which may resemble the two previously mentioned tooth is the concrescence. Concrescence can also be included under the category of double teeth. However, concrescence is defined as a union of two adjacent teeth by mode of cementum. The occurrence of concrescence requires two basic elements, close approximation of the two teeth and deposition of cementum causing the union of the teeth. The union may be present at the apical portion of the root or along the entire root length. Concrescent may lead to difficulty in extraction. Failure to detect a concrescence in an IOPA before extraction may lead to accidental extraction of the normal teeth. To summarize here, gemination, fusion and concrescence all may present as double teeth. However, these involve different pathologies and needs to be differentiated. Some points to remember here. Gemination is the single, is a division of a single tooth germ resulting in double teeth. There will be an increased number of crown than the normal set. The double teeth may share the pulp and tooth canals. If the process is complete, like twinning, we will have two separately formed teeth. Fusion on the other hand is the joining of two tooth germs resulting in a double tooth. However, the number of crowns are less than normal. This fusion may also show sharing of pulp and root canals. Concretion is from two tooth fully formed teeth wherein the crowns of the teeth appears normal. There is no sharing of the pulp or root canals. The two teeth are shared by a formation of cementum bridge between the two roots or between the roots of these two teeth. Okay, moving on to the next developmental anomaly which is referred to as dilaceration. Dilaceration is defined as a deviation or bend in the linear relationship of the crown to, the, to its root. 
Mechanical trauma to the primary predecessor tooth is thought to be the most probable cause which results in dilatation of the crown of the succedinous primary tooth. The recognition and diagnosis of dilatation often requires radiographs taken at various angulations. Clinical recognition of dilatation is important because it can lead to non-eruption, longer retention of primary predecessor tooth or possible apical fenestration of the buccal or labial cortical plate. Dilaceration causes a challenge for endodontic or orthodontic treatment as well as difficulty in extraction. The IOPA here reveals a dilacerated tooth with abnormal angulation in the crown and the root. The next developmental anomaly affecting the morphology is also known as talens cusp. Talens cusp is an unusual dental anomaly showing an accessory cusp-like structure projecting from the cingulum of an anterior tooth. It is so named because it resembles the eagle's talon. It is commonly seen in the maxillary lateral incisor and has been associated with syndromes such as Rubinstein and Tybee syndrome, Moore syndrome, Ellis Van Crevel syndrome, Stooge Weber syndrome. It varies in size, shape, length and mode of attachment to the crown and ranges from an enlarged cingulum to a large well delineated cusp extending beyond the incisal edge of the tooth. The cusp is composed of normal enamel and dentin containing varying extensions of pulp tissue. Talon's cusp may fracture or be abraded as soon as the tooth comes into occlusion, exposing the pulp. Hence, early recognition of this anomaly and prompt treatment should be instituted to prevent endodontic complications. Dense indente, also known as dense inv inv invaginatus, is another common developmental anomaly. It occurs as a result of an invagination of the external surface of the tooth crown before calcification. The invagination ranges from a short pit confined to the crown of the tooth to a deep invagination into the root, at times extending to or beyond the apex. The classical radiographic presentation of coronal dense invaginators is a pear-shaped invagination, a pear-shaped invagination of enamel and dentin with a narrow constriction at the opening of the tooth. Infection, trauma or pressure from the growing dental arch is thought to be responsible for dense invaginatus. A focal failure of growth or a proliferation of a part of the inner enamel epithelium may be involved in this invagination. It should be remembered that the invagination acts as a channel for entry of irritants and microorganisms and predisposed to the development of dental caries. Since the thickness of enamel is less, pulp necrosis occurs at an earlier stage. Dense evaginatus is a developmental aberration of a tooth, resulting in formation of an accessory cusp, whose morphology has been described as abnormal tubercle, elevation, protuberance, excrescence, extrusion or a bulge. It is also referred to as a tuberculated cusp, accessory tubercle, occlusal tuberculated premolar, Leong's premolar, evaginatus, odontoma and occlusal pearl. The term Leong's premolar is commonly used term for dense evaginatus. As you can see in this image, there is a, a tubercle protruded from the occlusal surface of the premolar. Such occurrences are referred to as Leong's premolar and these occur bilaterally. The occurrence of dense evaginators shows great racial differences with a high prevalence among people of mongoloid origin. 
This anomaly, anomaly is particularly common in the Malaysian population. It should be remembered here that when dense E vaginatus appears in the anterior region, it is usually occur, observed on the lingual surface and is described as talens cusp. The final dental anomaly to be discussed today is torodontism. This word is derived from the Latin word toro meaning bull and Greek term dont meaning tooth. So the word torodontism has been coined because of its morphological resemblance of the affected tooth to the tooth of ungulates or cut chewing animals. This anomaly is basically observed as teeth with large pulp chambers in which the bifurcation or trifurcation has shifted apically so that the pulp chamber has a greater apico occlusal height than in normal tooth and lacks a constriction at the level of cemento enamel junction. As you can see here in this IOPA, the constriction has been shifted to a area much apical than the cervical area. Torodontism primary affects primarily affects the molar teeth. The etiology of torodontism is still unclear, but it is thought to be caused by the failure of Hertwig's root sheet to invaginate at the proper horizontal level. Torodontism are commonly seen in syndromes such as Klinefelter syndrome, Down syndrome, trichodento osseous syndrome, orofacial digital syndrome, Moore syndrome or ectodermal dysplasia. Several clinical considerations would be associated with the management of teeth with torodontism. Extensive length of pulp chambers might create difficulty in location of root canals. The schematic representation here shows various forms of torodontism. These may be mild to accentuated cases as seen in the image D. Following torodontism, we have other developmental anomalies which are affecting the structure of the tooth. These anomalies may be encountered in relation to the enamel, to the dentin or cementum. These developmental anomalies will be the topic for our next class. So to conclude, anomalies of tooth occurs due to a disturbance during the developmental stage of the tooth. It is important to know the clinical significance of each dental anomaly so as to have an effective management of the patient. We have discussed a list of developmental anomalies today including the size, number and morphology. I request all to make a list of clinical significance of each as it is an important topic. Before I conclude, I would like to remind all about the importance of hand hygiene. Kindly make sure you follow it regularly so as to keep yourself as well as your family safe during this time of crisis. I request all to stay at home and stay safe. If anyone has any doubts or clarifications, please do so freely. You can email me, drop in a message or comment at the PIDC portal or you can engage in the discussion at the Google Classroom. With this I want to conclude my lecture for today. Thank you one and all and stay safe.